think was really good. Words are interesting, but Melo Conti tells us that every word is a compressed history. Right. Compresses into it the history of its past usages in different mm. contexts. Mm -hmm. And that there is then no hard and fast distinction between speaking the world and singing it into existence. And that's, I think, is where I would start from. And therefore, I don't think, nor do many people around the world who've been studied by ethnographers and where we know anything about what they understand speech or song to be, sometimes they distinguish between speech and song and sometimes they don't. But usually, if they do distinguish it, they don't distinguish it along precisely the same grounds that a modernist analytic cognitivist person or structural linguist or something like that would distinguish it for us. And to my mind, I think the place to start is to think of speech as a particular way of being. In just the same way that you recognize a person, a friend of yours, that you haven't seen for a while by their face, you also recognize them by their voice. You also recognize different animals by the voices they make. And we respond to animals, we respond to babies, we respond to children. Or any kind of being that produces sound in some form or other, we recognize them and respond to them in terms of the sounds that they make. And I think that if we're interested in human language with speech with voice, I think we should start with voice and think of voice as one of the most remarkable ways in which human beings are present in the world and to which we continually respond. We can then build up a theory of language from that starting point, but that's where I would start. And if you start with voice, then any kind of distinction between speech and song is something that's there to be explained. It's not part of your, your explanatory structure. Hi. Penny Harvey, and my question is really for Tim. And I wanted you to think about the difference between that beautiful knot that you've got outside on the table and the knot in my back I will have to pay the osteopath to remove. <laughs> and what I'm really trying to get you to think about is how you would think ethnographically of the relationship between things and objects. Because you say you hate objects, but you like things. But I would like to posit that ethnographically we have to deal with the relationship between things and objects. So when I'm working with totally modernist engineers, they're investing huge resources and energy into the design, enactment and production of a road. Let's talk about a kind of motorway that was built through the Bronx, for example, that wasn't done in terms of consultation of any of the local population that had to leave. But when you start looking on the ground at what they're actually doing, they have to work really hard in exactly the way you described to try and hold things together. So they worry and fuss around the materials, the people, the environments, the histories, the projections, everything that this is supposed to be doing. And it's a very, very leaky process. So what in the end they do is they do actually produce a compost heap, if you were to look at it in your terms, even though they prefer to think that they've produced a nice hard object. But of course the compost heap, the hard object is super leaky from the start so the first thing the engineer will tell you is that the road is always deteriorating from the minute that it's laid down. But I think what's interesting, particularly given your interventions yesterday, is that that is precisely, I won't give it a name because that thinks what's caused is a problem, but people like John Law and Bruno Latour are trying to show what are the leaks in the hard object so that you can rethink those hard objects into more leaky, composty, heapy kind of things. Which is great, except for if you wake up in the Bronx one morning and find a two lane highway going through what was your public space. Those spaces become much more like the knot in my back than the knot where you could pull a thread and have a nice, I can remember your nice word for it, but you can't kind of do much togethering with that object. It's quite hard to, which doesn't mean to say it's totally impossible to, but your kind of life work might be to try and compost heap your highway. Some things are harder than others. Oh, Jens, yeah, Manchester University. Morton and Tim's papers in particular, I think you provided us with some very interesting alternative images in terms of which to think about relations and things. What I was wondering and what I was missing a bit is perhaps an accompanying alternative vocabulary, one might say, in terms of which to think about things that used to be called such things as intentionality, value, valuation, motivation. Like I hear Morton talk about the imperative to connect. Where does such an imperative arise? And how can we think about this? And similarly, Tim talks about knots that achieve degrees of permanence resulting from tension and friction. And so again, I wonder where does this tension come from? I mean, how does friction arise? So I wonder if it's a non-issue as you see it, or whether we might want to think also about inventing, developing alternative images for those dimensions too. There's a lovely book by a designer come architect called Stuart Brand called How Buildings Learn, What Happens to Them After They're Built. And he points out there that the whole conceit of modernist architecture is based on the idea of permanence, that you design your structure, put it up, it's finished, and then it should stand for all time in the form that the great vision of the architect applied for it. But of course it's never like that on the ground. And that he says the idea is crystalline, the fact fluid. And in between this crystalline idea and the fluid, actual fluidity of the world, there's a kink. That's a lovely phrase, and he says that builders inhabit that kink. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, a beautiful way of putting it, that there is a mismatch, which is what Penny drew attention to, 
between the idealizations of we construe, design the object, we construct it, and so on, and, and the way that's presented perhaps to clients, for example, the actual process of what's going on on the ground. Whether actor network theory will help us think about that or get a bit of a recovery on that, I remain entirely agnostic. To date, actor network theory hasn't taught me anything that I didn't know already. I don't really want to engage with them because whenever I say something, people say, oh, Latour said that already. I say, okay, maybe he said it, so what? Because he said a lot of other things, and he says one thing on one thing and another page, another thing on another other page and so I don't know what he's saying. He says a lot, that's the trouble, and one can't <laughs> keep up with it. So I'm not sure whether actor network theory will help, but the idea of the mismatch between the world as it is imagined of objects and the world as one actually has to deal with it of forces and materials, I think is important and interesting to investigate. On knots, a naive way of saying it is would be that they're good knots and bad knots. The experience of illness as a knotted feeling. Mm. Uh, nobody actually wants to be ill, uh, mm. so far as I know. I didn't mean to imply any evaluation to that, to say that a knot is a, a good thing. And clearly, the, the, the thing I didn't have time to move on to, but Tina mentioned it, and it is absolutely critical to this, well, what everybody calls processes of development, ontogenetic development, that is, life growth going on. Actually, the process of ontogenesis is the key thing that I think is missing from actor network theory. Unless we talk about ontogenesis, about growth and development, and the embodiment that goes on with that, we can't talk about skill. Now, the thing about knots is that sometimes when things get tied up, they allow necessary things to continue for life to go on. Sometimes when things get tied up, they prevent those things going on. One understanding of pain, the suffering of all sorts, is where things get tied up in such a way that the movement gets jammed. One of the images that this is this idea of the woodsman cutting a log to make firewood. And of course, sometimes it happens that if there's a knot in the wood because this branch that originally went off there, you come down with your axe and your axe gets absolutely stuck. In a way, that's a bad knot. Sometimes life needs movement and when things get stuck, movement is impeded. Then you get suffering of a kind. And just relating to that later point, where does tension come from? How does friction arise? Friction arises, I think, from the pulls of materials. <coughs> materials are sometimes heavy. They sometimes have a degree of inertia. They sometimes pull against one another or scrape against one another. Anna Tsing has produced a book that's called Friction. You know, she's begun to develop that as a concept that might have some mileage to think about. Just to I just wanted to pick up on that fabulous metaphor of the knot and the question of the knot that's held together by tension. I just wanted to ask about this conference, if this conference is a knot, and I think it is, I think it's really coming together. What's the tension? So it's just a comment, but in a sense it's kind of picking up on things that have been said in this panel, but also yesterday. I think that from the title and from some of the ways in which we've been talking, it sounded as if the tension was between ANT or post-ANT and post-phenomenology. This is what Morton was saying at the beginning. And we've had a lot of discussion of the language of connectionism versus the language of flow and all this kind of stuff. But I would like to propose, I don't know whether this is now absolutely obvious to everyone or if it's a provocation, it's one of the two, possibly both, that actually the tension is not really there. I mean, that there we're talking about languages, ways of talking about relation in some form or another, either flowing or connectionist. And I was going to make a whole kind of list of the ways in which Tim Ingold's paper reminded me of things that Latour wrote elsewhere, but Tim's made that point himself, so I'm not going to run about that thing. But particularly the vitalism, I mean, having worked on Tard, you know, the idea that Tard, who's supposedly the grandfather of vector network theory, was completely a vitalist. It was all about growth and about gathering and about human beings being exactly like compost heaps, i.e. intra-action. So I think we're talking about the same kind of thing. That's why I really like more paper because I think that's where the tension is. The tension is, I think, between ways of trying to think about relation and ways of trying to think about non-relation, break, disconnection, cutting, pam, 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 all that kind of stuff. I think the thing that holds this knot together is that tension. That's what I would put as a provocation. I don't know if you agree or not. To Andrew's point, he said we're only speaking at particular times, maybe, but at other times we're also listening. And it's just as in string quartet, the violinist is only playing at particular times, but they're actually playing throughout the quartet, because at the times they're not playing, they're really along with the other players and waiting to come in again. But that's, by the way, I think we should be looking at sleeping, and particularly dreamless sleep. Particularly, there's so much, in, in all the discussions about agency and action, there's a, there's a wonderful paper by a geographer called Paul Harrison Durham, who's pointed out that somehow theorists want us all to be in perpetual motion, but we never, <laughs> we never get a moment that stops. But we're always, there's action is always going on. What actually happens when we fall into deep, not REM sleep, but deep sleep, where nothing is going on? And many people would say that's really when we forge a connection to place. Now, whether we call that social or asocial is, in a sense, beside the point. I'm not too bothered about defining the limits to sociality. But it does strike me that there may be something about human movement and ways of 
of being in the world that is somehow a bit like a slug. The slug deposits its backside on the ground and then pushes its front bit against the inertia of the back, and then it pulls the back up, and then it goes <laughs> off again like that. And, and I sometimes think that maybe that's the way one should understand the diurnal rhythmicity of human life, that we kind of deposit ourselves and then push ourselves forward against this deposit, gives us an anchor, and then pull up the back. Maybe that gives us a good model for the way that humans are in the world. Just on the question about 